There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. It just wouldn't be right to end the year without a top 10 list. And this episode is dedicated to my list of the top 10 money books that were featured on this show. Everything from career to investing to side hustling and more. So your job, it's just to sit back, enjoy a mashup of some great sound bites from my top 10 authors, and then head to the show notes for a massive roundup of all the authors that have been on this show. By the end of this episode, you'll have what you need to build a stellar money book library and tips to help you end the year just right. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Compton Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. I have a sort of guilty pleasure. It is definitely reading nonfiction books. I love everything nonfiction. I love documentaries, you name it. If I can hear about somebody's life story... It almost doesn't matter who they are. I am so game from it. And with books, I just love gleaming wisdom, gobbling up stories of other people, and really going for a nosedive into a great book. But it's not just me. I know you also have loved listening to these authors share their inside secrets. And just in case, just I'm just putting this out there. In case you're looking to buy yourself one or two more gifts this holiday season, maybe you didn't get exactly what you wanted, well, welcome to my top 10 authors. This is the gift to you. Go out, buy one of these books, gobble up 
yes, I'm going to use that word multiple times, (laughs) gobble up the book and I guarantee you're going to take at least a gem or two from all of these books into the new year. So let's start with your career. Your career brings us to the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you may not even know that yet, and that's okay. I'm actually still figuring that out for myself. So I think it's perfectly fine to say, I actually don't really know. But no matter where you are with your career, I want you to embrace a few things. One, that your career is not who you are. It's just what you do. It's just that simple. Number two, it is definitely a journey and not a destination. I started my first business when I was 19 in college, and I had absolutely zero idea what I was doing. (laughs) And I would have never been able to guess that from that point to this point, I would be doing what I'm doing now. So the moral of the story is just embrace it, embrace all the crazy turns. You just never know. And I think that's the exciting thing. And number three, do the thing that makes you feel alive. Even if nobody really understands you, if you're going to bring anything into the new year, it's that. Do the thing that really makes you feel good, even if right now it's just on the side and it's not necessarily for money just yet. You got to feel fulfilled. You just absolutely have to. So our first author in the career section is Ayana Angel. She is a podcast host and author of Switch, Pivot, or Quit. And on the podcast, she shares her journey to figuring out what she wants her purpose to be and how you can do the very same thing. Let's take a listen. Yeah, I just wanted to start out, you know, you talk about this career transformation that you've made yourself. I don't want to spoil any of the thunder I want want to hear in your own (laughs) voice, but I'd love to know what are some of the things that you learned about growing into your purpose and really really figuring out that that transformation was so necessary to your own personal career success? So, you know, what's so funny early on, I never knew that I needed to grow into my purpose. I, I, <laughs> I really didn't. I was, I was checking all the boxes, right? So I was doing all the things that were expected of me, graduating from college, getting your first good job. I'm using my air quotes, you know, like all of these things that having a 401k, all of these things that you think you're supposed to do. So I wasn't really worried about purpose. It wasn't until I got into my career a number of years before I started thinking, thinking the thoughts of what's next? What else? Should I be doing something bigger? Is the work that I'm doing meaningful enough? Do I want to be doing this forever? And all these questions started coming up. And it really started to take shape when I decided to do this side hustle. I had a jewelry business on the side and it was doing really well in terms of press and media coverage and everything and people wearing the jewelry. We had Beyonce wear the jewelry. We had all these celebrities, Alicia Keys, all this great stuff, right? So that gave me like this fuel and this energy from a creative side. I felt like I was tapping into more than just what I was doing on the nine to five side with being like a sports entertainment publicist. It was giving me an outlet and something else to sort of like buy into. But then I also started thinking like, What I'm doing nine to five, this sports PR, which can sometimes be a very thankless type of career. You know, everybody wants you to get and do certain things, but then there's very little fanfare once it's done for you. You know, it's it's all about, you know, the person that you're doing it for. So I started thinking like, what do I want my impact to be? And I really started having this nagging feeling that my purpose was larger than what I was doing and that the impact that I was making day to day wasn't big enough. And I didn't know who I needed to be impacting, but I just knew that I wasn't making the type of impact that I could be making. I felt I had this nagging feeling like there was something bigger. So it wasn't until I really started digging in and trying to figure out what was driving me, what was I good at, and answering those questions, which was a journey in itself. That was the time where I started to realize that. I needed to make a switch, pivot, or quit. And this was before switch, pivot, or quit was a thing. Like I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. I just knew I needed some transition. 
So I did all, a lot of the personal development work and then I came to writing. And through my journey of writing, I had a book that was traditionally published and that worked out amazing because I had no um, idea what I was getting myself into, nor did I have any connections in that space. So I just learned everything as I was going. And, you know, it was a blessing to get a traditional publishing deal. But after that, I started to experience a lot of people coming up to me or reaching out to me, expressing how proud of me they were and how much I had inspired them by my journey. Now, when I set out on my journey, I didn't even know what the journey could look like or would look like. I didn't set out to inspire anybody. I set out to change my situation that I was no longer content in. I think through getting the feedback from other people and seeing how my journey was impacting people, that started to make me recognize and sort of identify a purpose within all of that. And that's the long story of how I got to this point. <laughs> I love I love the story. I, I, I'm curious, do you think that, that it's something that we have to go through a little bit of our career? We have to go through a few years at least before we can have a position where we can think, okay, what is my passion? What mm-hmm. are those things that I like? Or do you think you could do that when you're when you're rolling out of college? No, I think you have to have some years under your belt. And the reason that I think you have to have some years under your belt, it's, it's, at this point, it's not just about the experience thing. It's more about the life thing. You know, you, you, you start out in this position where you're going from high school to college and everyone's asking you, even before you make the transition to college, everyone's asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? You don't really know. All you know is what you're exposed to, right? And some of us are exposed to more things than other people, fortunately. And and some people just have very limited exposure. So their ideas of what they think they can be or what they may want to be usually have something to do with their parents, their background, something that they see around them or careers that they that their parents deem successful, which they in turn deem successful. And usually it's money driven, right? It's like, oh, you want to be a doctor? You want to be a lawyer? You want to be something that's going to generate a lot of income for you and security. So you're asked this question and you're faced with this question so early on, you're pressured almost into making a decision when it's time to go to college because you have to decide a track. You have to decide a concentration. You do it. Even if you don't really know, even if you're not really sure. So by the time you get out into the world and you've decided this track and you settle on it, some of us get out into the working world and immediately know this is not where I'm supposed to be because this, I didn't even feel connected to this when I was doing it in school. I just had gotten so far into it that I felt like I needed to keep going with it. So now it's just about a completion thing. And then some people get on the other side of college and they still think that that's what they want to do, but they need time to work their way through all of us. We all need time to work our way through ourselves as a human being. It's not about school anymore. It's not about checking the boxes. It's not about showing up somewhere and trying to be the best that you can be. It's about who are you inside? What makes you tick? What do you connect to? Who do you connect to? What makes you get excited? You know, what drives you? Where are your natural interests? Sometimes we have to suppress those natural interests because of all these outside factors, you know, namely family, friends, all expectations, all of these things. So I think when you get, when you first get into a job, it's okay, especially when you just graduate, it's okay to know that maybe this is not your forever, but I think that you really start understanding more about yourself, how you show up, what your likes and dislikes are, what your interests are, um, what type of people you gravitate to, what type of situations you gravitate to, what type of situations you thrive in versus those that you don't. You start to really understand all of those things once you've been out there in the world a bit. And when I say out there in the world, that means working as well as just existing and living. Ah, I just love Ayana's message. And since we're still on the topic of career, I cannot pass up at the opportunity to mention one of my favorite authors and multiple podcast episode guests, Jacqueline Twilley. She is an expert at helping you become a negotiation expert. So when you're going in for that job interview and you really want to get what you're worth, 
this is the time to have Jacqueline in your back pocket. So she's got a lot of great books. One of my favorite is called Don't Leave Money on the Table, Negotiation Strategies for Women Leaders and Male-Dominated Industries. Yep, it is an absolute gem. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. <laughs> I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Without a doubt, the most requested book category by far for guests on this show is investing. You just simply can't get enough. And I agree, I've read my share of investing books. I even talk about having a few on my bedside table, like Plant Your Money Tree by Michelle Snyder. This is a must, must book. I know I say this every time I talk to her, but I pick up this book every couple of months and read it over and over again. And every time I learn something new, and it's just written in a language that is so digestible and easy and approachable. And I just, I really appreciate it. I don't like those really intellectual investing books. It just doesn't make sense to me. I need something that I can just really sink my teeth into. But there's also always room for Invested, which is a New York Times bestseller book by my friend and brilliant investing guru, Danielle Town. We actually hadn't met when I did this interview, but I just knew that we had to become friends after, and that's what we did. So call it crazy friend stalker, but we made a connection on the podcast, which is probably why it's such a genuine, great interview. And then afterwards, we're like, hey, you know what? We should actually be real life friends. So in, in 2019, Jeff and I actually flew to Switzerland where Danielle lives, and we hung out for a week scheming about some business ideas and more, and it just clicked. She's just one of the coolest people I know. So her book, Invested, tells the story of Danielle ditching her corporate law career and really jumping into the world of investing. So let's take a listen. And, you know, you talk about obviously the crux of the book, Invested, is really this 
12 month kind of journey that you took with with your dad as kind of your your coach to get you to this place of financial freedom. You know, you talked just a little bit about it earlier, but take me back though, you know, what was life like before you started on this journey to financial freedom? Did you think this was even possible? Oh god, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I had um I went to a whole bunch of school. I have like a ridiculous number of graduate degrees. <laughs> And um, because I kept on first, I wanted to maybe go and I just loved studying religion. So I have a graduate degree in religion. And then I thought, no, I want to go to law school and become like a First Amendment lawyer, which I really wanted to do. So I went to law school. And then I got fascinated by entrepreneurs. And by the way, you asked me about what my dad did when I was young. He was an investor and an entrepreneur. And that kind of came back to me when I was in law school. And I started getting really interested in companies and in helping startups and venture capital get going. And I realized this was actually connected to, again, to my childhood and to money. I mean, good Lord, yes. like, I need a shrink on this stuff. <laughs> and so and so I became a startup and venture capital attorney, which I absolutely loved and lived in Boulder, Colorado, had my dream job, had a great house, like everything was really good. And I planned to live there forever. So I never thought about what to do in the future. I just, I never really thought about retirement. Like retirement to me was, and frankly, probably still feels a bit like this kind of like far off golf course, gold watch kind of thing that I frankly don't really want. Like I want to have a really good life now. And yes, I can't really imagine retiring when I'm 60 and living another 30 years, like kind of chilling. So I, I don't know, like I'm, I'm focused on now and the next 10 years and, and, and really like being able to live the kind of life I want. And so I was doing that. But then I started to get sick, as I said, and I started to realize I wasn't going to be able to keep that lifestyle up for too much longer. And that's what really gave me that push into, okay, I need to basically find like a side hustle. I need to figure something else out to do so that if I can't keep this job up, I'm going to be okay. And um, and that combined with finding out about compounding and inflation, which are, I don't know if you, well, you know about this, I'm sure, but inflation, <laughs> I didn't know this, so I'm just going to say it. Inflation affects our savings. So my whole plan was like, I'm not going to bother with investing. I don't want anything to do with the financial world or markets because they go up and down and I don't understand it and I can't predict it. So I just didn't want anything to do with it. So I was like, I'm just going to save all my money and that'll be great. And in like 20 years, I will magically probably know more than I do now and I will just know what to do and it'll be okay. And so I was really proud of myself and I mentioned <laughs> this plan to my dad and he goes, Danielle, what about inflation? And I was like, what? What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> and he goes, what about inflation? Inflation is going to destroy your savings. And I said, no, it won't. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then and I, he was like, don't you? I mean, it was this total like disconnect of like, are you stupid? Like, do we understand each other here? What, what are we talking about? And You're like, said, do you see how many degrees I have? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, he knows that I'm terrible with numbers and money stuff. Um, so he was, but it was a little bit of like, are you this terrible? Really? And so I said, well, I mean, I know about like inflation in a sort of a macroeconomic sense where like prices go up for some reason that I can't totally explain. And that's pretty much what I know. And he was like, yeah. And when that happens, the value, the buying power of your savings is going to go down. So if you save $20,000 in 20 years, you are not going to be able to buy $20,000 worth of stuff with that $20,000. And the rate of inflation is an average of 3% a year, which means, and this is the part that nobody ever connected for me, we have to do something with our money to get an average of 3% per year just to keep up with inflation or else we're losing money. Like it's insane. And I mean, through no fault of our own, by the way, through like being good little savers who are doing the right thing. And once I found that out, I was like, oh my God, I have to actually take action here. I can't just save my money. 
I, it's it's still as you can tell it still kind of blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know you you make a good point because I think that you know somebody could pick up the book and be like, "Oh, well her dad is this investing legend. She has to like just, you know, almost by like osmosis have all this knowledge." And yet you're so honest that, you know, you didn't and and numbers weren't your thing. Maybe they still aren't exactly your thing. And I think that gives it so much more credence because it's almost like, okay, if you can do it and you're telling me exactly how you did it, why can't I do it as well? And I think there's something really powerful about that, you know, just that that honesty too. I think that message is so important. If any if I can do this, anybody can do this. And yes, I was am super lucky to have a father who I can ask all the questions I want. And he is amazing because he answers all of my questions. Like he doesn't have to do that. And he just sits with me and will stay with me for hours until I get it. He's amazing. Like I couldn't pay for that. So I'm really glad that I can then pass that on and share all of that with people through the book and through our podcast and really show that (laughs) this stuff is how to put it exactly it's like it's it's simple it's not the it's not always easy but it is simple and all we need is some education and the thing is we don't get financial education they don't teach us this stuff in school and i have a lot of degrees as i said and i'm an educated person and i did not understand that inflation affects my savings because i didn't study economics so we are all like so siloed now that if you're not in business and I have to say, though, I even get emails from people who are in business and say to me, I didn't realize that. Like, I had never connected that to my own money before. So I think there's a lot of shame around not knowing. There's there's a, there's a combination of, like, we don't have anybody to ask. And I'm lucky and I have somebody who I could ask. And I'm excited that we can put it out there and uh, and and you guys can all find out the same stuff. So in Invested, Danielle walks you through, like I said, this 12-month journey into investing in a really tangible way. And you can literally follow along in the book month after month after month. So if you're looking for more investing books, besides the couple that I recommended that are definitely my must-haves, check out the show notes because there's a lot more favorites featured there, such as Broke Millennial Takes on Investing by Aaron Lowry, who's been on the show several times. And Passive Income Aggressive Retirement by Rachel Richards, who is just killing it on the passive income quest. If you are looking for ideas on passive income, you absolutely need to pick up her books. So that then takes us to our biggest money category, which is just managing your money and your life, which is seemingly all of our quest, right, to just figure this thing out. That's probably why you're here listening to this show. And this is where we've had some stellar interviews over the years. It's almost impossible for me to pick the final five books from this category because I think you really need all of these books. And when you go to the show notes and you look at all the books and you look them all up, I know you're definitely going to agree, but we have to start somewhere. So let's start with this great book by author John Seforic. In his book is called The Wealthy Gardener. And I had this email pitch from John in my inbox for a few weeks. And to be honest, I just, I wasn't sure if this was a fit for the show. I just, I didn't really know what to think about it. So one weekend, I grabbed a cup of tea and my favorite blanket and read through the entire book in two sittings. Took me two days, I'll admit. But I have so many dog-eared and highlighted pages that it is almost embarrassing to admit if you if you're someone who hates dog-eared pages, you definitely wouldn't want my copy. But this book spoke to me in so many ways. Maybe just the idea that we're all on this search for a metaphoric wealthy garden, a life full of stuff we really want and missing the stuff that just doesn't serve us. For me, that's putting money in a place that doesn't rule my life, but it's just a tool, as I tell you so often on this show. So take a listen to a few minutes from my interview with John and do yourself a favor and grab his book, The Wealthy Gardener. I promise you, you're going to have dog-eared as many pages as I do. Yeah, I'm. I'm so excited. You actually uh, found me and and sent me a copy of your book, The Wealthy Gardener. And 
I sent you a message last week, but I have read through the book and I have dog-eared so many pages in the book that it's kind of crazy. I, I went back to pull some things for this interview and I thought, okay, I should have highlighted because <laughs> I have so many pages um, dog-eared, but it really resonates with me because I, I speak a lot about this on the podcast, but it's about prosperity, but from a perspective, I think that feels real and tangible. And that's the message I'm always trying to get out, especially when I talk about money mindset and things like that, that um, prosperity is important, but there's a way I think to think about it that um, that just feels more real, more um, tangible, like I said. I can tell you that that's why the book was published and, uh, I mean, was, was taken over by Penguin. They felt the same thing. They couldn't quite put their finger on it, but it was, it resonated and it resonated with the masses, you know? So like yeah. they're trying to figure out why does this resonate? <laughs> and I say it resonates because, you know, I wrote a book for my son and I, I'm writing from the experience of having done it. And so there's not a lot of hypothetical theory here. It's a lot about the struggle and, and the victory, and the good, and the bad, and, and and the reality. So, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, and what is it about prosperity that's important to talk about? I <laughs> know <laughs> this could be like an hour conversation. I realize that <laughs> we have tw- we have twenty hours or twenty minutes here, right? Uh, you know what? I think that I, I what's important to talk about for me. I think in terms of what I wanted my son to understand was that it's a, it's victory. It's not a, it's not a something that you would have as far as like a greedy goal. It's not about, um, amassing wealth for the sake of, uh, looking good. Prosperity is, is a bigger word to me. It's more than just money. It's a full life. It's money and money does help a fuller life. But prosperity to me is a fuller, richer life of using your full potential. And you can certainly use your full potential quite a bit more if you have more money and your life isn't all based around chasing that almighty dollar. So it's it's winning. That's what it is. And it's a holistic, it feels holistic to me. Like it feels, like you said, sometimes when we talk about wealth, we in our minds conjure up an idea of a dollar amount sitting in a bank account. But I think if we can understand wealth from a broader perspective, A, that number doesn't necessarily have as much power over us, or maybe there isn't that that scarcity uh, attached to it, but we can see things from a broader perspective and we can appreciate wealth, a, a lot of different things that we have in our life. I'll tell you the word holistic you use there. I, I couldn't agree more. I, in living my own life out, I don't know where you... Sh- I don't know how you cheat one area of your life and then do well in the other areas of your life because it's all about intentionality. Like you're either going to be intentional with your time, with your actions, with your gifts and talents, or you're not. And there's very, there's a hard line to draw. Like you can't be intentional over here and then, and then mindless over here. And so intentionality does encompass a life. No doubt about it. So I do see it as holistic and an overall idea. And it's hard to be a loser in one area and a winner in another. It's either just <laughs> you're in or you're not. Yeah. And, and to follow that up, you, you talk a lot about um, mindset, of course, this wealth, this idea of a wealth mindset, which I think it goes right in with what we're talking about. Why Why do you think we need to have these things? Like, why do we need to have a wealth mindset and cultivate that? Even if we feel, especially right now, the time we're in, maybe we feel like we're in a place of lack or we lost our job or our business, whatever it may be. How can we cultivate that idea of still having a wealth mindset? You know, what's important is is just keeping the focus, no matter what external stimulus is all around us, you know, the 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 major lesson from the wealthy gardener. I mean, there's a, there's a million lessons within there, but I wrote a book yes. to my son about this. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you think about it, like on the very first couple of chapters here, you read the book, is a farmer who's using only a portion of his land and he's not happy with his harvest. And so a neighbor comes over and of course he says, why don't you use a bigger portion of your land? Well, the farmer says that's a good idea. So he starts using a bigger portion of his land. Okay, so that's a start. Now we, we move into, are you planting the right seeds in that bigger portion of your land? And so you have to get the seeds straightened out. It's a classic metaphor. And even you, once you do that, if you plant on you know the biggest portion of your land, you're planting the right seeds, you still have to figure out the idea that what you do 
after the work is over, that small little choices you make day to day to day, they still matter a lot in terms of what you end up with in the end, you know, over time. And so it all comes down to this consistent daily intentionality. And that's what it's all about. So yeah, I, I think that that's the main thing. What is intentionality? It's controlling your mind. It's being mindful. It's choosing that. Like I can tell you that my own, my own practice every day of my life, including this day, is to close my eyes and envision my future and feel that future and experience that. Why do I do that? It sets the intentionality. It gets you in the river of, of what you're heading toward. And then you'd make the right actions, the, the right choices, and you do the right stuff. You think the right thoughts once you're in that river of whatever your intention is. What John's talking about is intentionality, being really intentional with your money. And that's hopefully another reason why you're listening to this podcast as well, because you want to make mindful money choices and not just have money float out the proverbial windows and not know where it's going. Another one of my favorite books is Work Your Money, Not Your Life by Roger Ma. Roger is a CFP and wrote this great book about helping you create a vision for your life and then figuring out the money steps that you need in order to make that happen, right? It's great to have the goal, but we got to figure out like what are the actual steps that we need to take? And Roger's book really breaks that down. He shares some important wisdom that achieving your money goals, it isn't about what you make but it's about what you spend. So I want you to just think about that for a minute. It's not about what you make, but it's about what you spend and probably how you spend it more importantly. What if you took even a fraction of what you spent this month on stuff you really didn't need and directed it instead towards the stuff you really want to do, whether that's pay off debt, invest, save for a big post-COVID trip, launch a business, give back to your community, whatever it is. Would that money be better served going towards those goals? I mean, yes and no. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. That's just reality, right? But that's why I created something I call stop, look, and ask rule. And I apply this to all my online purchases. So I have to physically make myself see the price with tax, shipping, like the whole kit and caboodle, and then ask myself, is this something I really need? or really, really want? Or would it be better to send this money towards a goal? And I do this with every single purchase. And what happens is a lot of times I look at the total dollar amount. In fact, I was just looking at this the other day, there was a sweatshirt I wanted. And when I put it in the cart, and I added the shipping and the tax, it was like $75 for a sweatshirt. And I was like, okay, realistically, how often am I going to wear that sweatshirt? I'm probably going to wear it at home. Does it really matter if I'm wearing a $75 sweatshirt at home? What could I do with that $75? Oh, that's right. I want to help our local food pantry. Let me just send that $75 that way. Or, hey, I've got some holiday debt. Eh, $75 could go to pay off that debt or go towards another gift for a family member. You get the idea. And sometimes the answer is, yeah, I actually want to buy that sweatshirt for $75 and I'm okay with it. But what I did was I made a mindful choice. I didn't just hit the button to buy. I actually stopped to really think about it. And when you start having those moments of decision making, that's when you start to be more in charge of your money. And that's really where the light bulb is going to go off and where you're going to start to be able to achieve a lot of your goals. Another one of my favorite books in this category is The Middle Finger Project, which is a book about how to get rid of imposter syndrome and live the life you deserve. So this book and interview was so full of fun and noteworthy tips, and it's a great interview and book to help you really step into your sweet spot without apologies in life. So if 2020 was a little bit of a dumpster fire for you, this is definitely the book for you, my friend. And then that takes us to the last book on my top 10 list. And I saved what I feel is one of the very best for the last. Ken Honda wrote this book called Happy Money, The Japanese Art of Making Peace with Your Money. And I kind of heart him for doing so. This is another book on my bedside table. I'm not kidding to you. If you came into my room right now, you would see these books on my table and I pick them up often. And it's 
when I need to remember that money isn't so hard and doesn't define me, I pick this book up because it's a, such a great message. So Ken talks about this really cool way of thinking money when it comes in and when it comes out, and just this idea of what does it mean to actually have happy money. So I think we need to hear this one more time. I wanted to start out, you know, you say that that money is energy. It can mm-hmm. be happy or it can be unhappy. So tell me a little bit, like, what makes money happy? You know, one time I was approached by this woman and she um, asked me if she could take a look at my wallet. And she just scanned all my bills and she said, Ken, you're good to go because all your money is smiling. And she told me that money can smile or laugh. And if, if you're not uh, doing what you love, if you're taking advantage of other people, your money could be crying in your wallet. And I thought, wow, wow that's an interesting concept. And I started thinking, you know, there must be two kinds of money, happy money and unhappy money. And happy money makes you smile when you receive it and when you spend it. Whereas unhappy money makes you, uh, ooh, you know, frustrated and uh, when you receive the money. And also when you spend money, it gives me scary feeling too. So uh, it's a a big difference. And it doesn't really matter how much money you make or you you have. It's about your uh, emotional attitude toward money. Uh, Yeah, I think that's so powerful. And I always say we don't spend enough time talking about, like you said, the emotional attitude towards money. We want to go straight Mm -hmm. on to the how-tos. How do I grow my investments or how do I budget? or And all of those things are really important. Mm -hmm. But the emotional component of it, I have found to be a game changer for myself and for countless other people that I've, I've shared this message to. But I'm curious, like, why do we ignore this emotional component of money? You know, I think uh, we're so hooked up with the numbers. So yeah. uh, the more is better. And I talk about money container um, in general. I teach Japanese, uh, hundreds of thousands of Japanese people how to um, find your right size. But in, for example, in North America, I get many questions like, how can I big, uh, how can I make my money container bigger? So, uh, there's an assumption that more is better. But in fact, uh, I approach, uh, differently. It's like more Zen way. So, um, can you satisfy with what you have? Because, uh, happiness is found when you are fully content with what you have. So don't try to go for bigger, better, you know, more. Otherwise, um, your life will be in the hell of endlessly wanting more. Wow. Yeah, that's so powerful. I, I, tell me a little bit more about this, like finding the right size container. How, mm-hmm. do, you, how do you practically go about that and, and yeah. figure out what that yeah. is for you? Yes. You know, my father was a very successful accountant, tax accountant, and he taught me everything about money. And then I, as I grew up, I found out that um, we had guests on weekends for my father uh, to, to visit his clients. And I realized when I was small, um, there are people who brought very expensive, you know, uh, sweets and nice things for a souvenir. And there are those that who didn't bring anything, you know, to our house. So <laughs> I, you know, I realized that there are two kinds of people, generous people and not so generous people. And I found out that there are people who are good at making money, receiving money, and who are not so good at making money. So I found out that there is this thing called money container. We're born with a a certain money container. It could be a small size. It could be a big size. Somebody like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, they were born with a big, huge money container. And uh, there's those who are making a minimum wage. They don't think... Um, outside of the box. So those people uh, were born with smaller uh, bucket of uh, money container. Hmm, Interesting. So can you, you know, using those examples, saying those people are born into those money containers, Mm -hmm. can you then change your money container? Of course, of course. But, you know, um, uh, it's so interesting because it's, um, as you talk about, Sean, it's, uh, it's about a mindset. You know, when, when we think that we're so limited, you know, we're just, uh, if we are limited to, for example, employee mentality, we tend to think how much money we get per hour or per week or per month. But, uh, wealthy people think of money in terms of 
um, rendering service to millions of people and then uh, receive money. So um, right. they tend to think more about entrepreneur mind. So, uh, and in fact, the, the more service and the better service and happier service they provide, uh, they're likely to receive more. So that's um, how life works in this um, uh, capitalism. But, you know, um, when you just take a look at your life, um, how much service you give out, uh, you receive later on. So it's it's the money container, but at the same time, it's how much you're willing to offer to the world. So if you're offering little, uh, working minimum wage uh, kind of work, you're not uh, giving so much service. But if you're just providing so much information, so much love, and for example, if you own a restaurant chain, you are serving hundreds of thousands of people every day uh, through your company. So uh, right. the more service you provide, the more you receive. And it's a very simple fact. I like that. Yeah. Someone once uh, said to me that I was a kind person and that kindness is always paid back in mm -hmm. the universe. And that's something I've held on to for, for a long time. I think that's really interesting because I can see so many examples of people that I'm friends with or that are in my sphere where they're kind or maybe they they extend their knowledge to someone when someone needs that knowledge or whatever it might be. And I, I watch that come back to them. So that's like a really interesting concept, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple. So if you're not satisfied with your financial status or financial situation, uh, just, just look at your life. How much have you given in the past? And if you're not giving so much out in the world, you're not receiving as a result. It's, an, and giving, it's as simple as that. Right. And giving doesn't have to just be money, monetarily speaking, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's giving of your, of your knowledge or of your time of, of being in, a, you know, a shoulder to cry on maybe for a friend. I mean, it's giving of yourself in lots of different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, but financially, you have to give something to the world that people are so excited to say thank you back to you. So in this world, Thank you often means some sort of monetary com compensation. Uh, for example, if you're providing coaching service, you know, you're just probably talking with your friends and just you're tr so trustworthy friends and your friends, friends heard about you and they ask you for some advice. And then probably you're, you give out your service for free, you know, for a cup of tea or coffee. But there are so many friends. For example, one of my friends who is a very well known astrologer when she was younger, uh, she was on the phone for um, hours after six o'clock and uh, her boyfriend complained about it because um, she's so tied with the phone, but she did it for, for fun. And later on, she realized that she um, is so busy with talking with her friends. And one day her friends, friends, friends said, I don't mind paying you, but can you um, uh, have it some time? as early as possible, and then she started get, uh, getting paid. So that's how she grew wow. her business. So, you know, the more service you provide, they want to thank you in, form of, in the form of money. It doesn't have to, but I think it's a very simple, easy way to show your appreciation. I love this idea of money being a gesture of thank you. I think if you think about it, you're saying thank you with all the ways you spend your money. And also if somebody is saying thank you in all the ways that you're earning money, it's just this constant transaction of, of thankfulness. And, and maybe thankfulness is the spin you need on money, especially after this year. Whatever spin you need to take, I grant you full permission to take it. Well, my friend, we've made it through my top 10 money book list. For the complete list, head over to the show notes. There's links to all the books. Shop away, buy yourself a gift, and really embrace that you can make next year different than this year. I know it's hard to imagine for a lot of us, but I really believe that it's possible. So I highly recommend all of these books grab a few, take a read, learn, and then pass them along to somebody else. These are great books. And I feel like if we're going to really, if we're going to really help the mission of financial literacy and helping people get in a better relationship with their money, 
We also have to inspire them. So if you pick up a book and you love it, give it to somebody else. Just spread the word around. And thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, did you know that one of the best ways to say thank you to this podcast is just by sharing it with your friends? So take a minute, send this episode to a few friends. And for doing so, I just want to say a huge thank you to you. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com, where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash CD specials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC.